Checking to see how we're doing here. Hopefully we're live. I am now live. Okay. Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 21st of July, 2018. It's my mom's birthday, so after this session, I need to give her a call. Uh, we have a question and answer session with lots of questions that have been submitted ahead of time. And we also will take questions live here once we've gotten through these. So let's go ahead and jump in. First question is from Matt. He has uh, Zoom F8 and he loves it. I use it mostly for two-person talking head setup where I'm recording from two road link systems. However, due to the added noise in my final mix, the F8N auto mix feature sounds very intriguing. My question is, about what I should expect from the auto mix when one person is talking and the second person is chiming in with affirmations, etc., such as yeahs and uh huhs. Have you te tested the auto mix enough to know how it handles them? I'm afraid it would end up sounding like an auto leveler. Good question. So, a couple things, Matt. Number one, the auto mix is just affects the. Uh, just affects the mix track. So if you're recording isolated tracks in addition to that, you can always go and change that in post if you want to. So that's one thing to know, first of all. Second of all, as soon as the other person does their affirmations, their uh-huhs, their yeahs, whatever, it picks that up. It, it's very good at opening up that channel very quickly when someone starts talking. So it's, um, anyway, it's, it's, it, those are gonna come through. That is just part of how it works. Um, I think it works pretty nicely. I've been pretty happy with it so far. I haven't tested, I wouldn't say I've tested it extensively. I have used it on a couple of occasions now and been very happy with it. The great news is, of course, if you record isolated channels in addition to a stereo mix, it's not like the, the auto mix is going to destroy anything for you. You can always go back and mix in post if you need to and change what you've got. So yeah, it's definitely gonna pick up the yeses and the uh-huhs and all that kind of stuff. So good question, Matt, thanks for that. Next question's from Jeff. Can you explain AES? I see it on mixers and wonder what it is and how it works in a sound workflow. Yes, uh, AES is a digital um, interconnect format. So what that means is that if you have a, um, I guess the, the scenario I use it in most often is I have a Sound Devices 633 sound mixer recorder. It has uh, an AES input and it has an AES output. I use the AES input from my wireless system which is an audio limited A10, which can output uh, digital AES. And then I can also output digital AES from the 633 into my Ursa Mini Pro, which is the camera right back here. The, the, just to explain how that works. So with the wireless system, the way that works is the audio is captured by the transmitter and it's converted into digital from analog. It's transmitted digitally, and if you have it outputting digitally to your uh, recorder or mixer, like I do on the 633, then it never has to convert it back to analog into the recorder and then back to digital. So it's doing less conversion, which in the end should result in better overall sound quality. And then also on the other end, outputting digital AES from the Sound Devices 633 into the Ursa Mini Pro bypasses the preamplifiers and the analog to digital converter in the camera. So we bypass all of that mediocre audio <laughs> um, circuitry within the camera, and it saves that digital stream directly to the video file. So that's what AES is, and that's how I partic in particular use it. And it can be used, again, to hook up things from mixers to cameras, um, and from there are even some microphones that are digital AES microphones that output a digital AES signal over the standard XLR uh, cable. So that's what AES is. Number two. I have seen read about other soundies using devices like the Sound Devices 442 or 552 in front of an F4 or F8. Again, we're talking about the Zoom F4 and F8 recorders. Can you explain the pros and cons to a setup like this? If one wanted to have ISO channels recorded but could not afford a 633 yet and found that the F4, F8 ergonomics for going between trim and fade kind of clunky compared to how to having separate dials like on the Sound Devices devices, would this be a good alternative? Yes and no. Um, and there are plenty of people that do that. 
Um, I believe the biggest limitation is on both the 442 and the 552. You only have two outputs, so that means you can really only send two isolated channels from the sound devices to the mix or to the zoom or the mix pre or whatever. You, well, and the mix pre wouldn't necessarily make sense, but in any case, um, so you can't, you know, if for example with an F8 you can get five in or eight inputs, but you can't send eight isolated outputs from the sound devices. You can only send two, so that's the major limitation. If you're going to go ahead and do the mix and just record stereo to the zoom, then that'll work fine. Um, but you're committed at that point. You're not recording ISOs at that point. That mix is that mix. And so whatever you happen to capture during recording time is what you get on your recording. So those are the kind of the pluses and minuses. You do get some very nice preamplifiers, but the Zoom F8 and the Zoom F4 and the Zoom F8N have really very good preamplifiers. So um, I... I would say in that case, I'd probably just stick with the Zoom F-Series recorder and just go with that. It just seems like you'd be adding a lot of bulk. Um, is there a difference in sound? Some people say yes. Um, <laughs> that's up to you to decide. I, I don't think it's a big enough difference to really warrant that, but that's my own opinion. So, All right, next up, he ha uh, Jeff asks another question here. I've read that there are issues with line level signals with the F4, F8, as in you need an XLR female to TRS male adapter to take an XLR line level to the F4, F8. Is this true? Yes. So let me explain what that means. So here we have an F4, and you can see on the inputs here, they take both an XLR or a quarter inch going into this uh, input jack here. If you put an XLR in here, that's telling the F4 that it's a microphone. If you put a quarter inch in here, that's telling the F4 that there is a line level signal coming across that quarter inch cable. So that is, that's all that means. Um, it's not a problem. It doesn't mean you get lower audio quality or anything like that. All it means is that you have to use the right cable to tell the zoom what you're sending to it. So it, it's just a little bit less convenient potentially if you are trying, if you don't know exactly what you're gonna have on the other end, if you're gonna be taking a feed from a mixer like a soundboard and you don't know what kind of outputs it has, you have to bring a number of cables to make sure you have everything you need to get what you need into your Zoom. So um, that's really all that means. It's, it doesn't mean it's a massive issue, but it, it's just something you need to know. Okay, next, uh, what do you do to eliminate RFI? Well, whew, that's a massive question. Um, and then there's some follow-ups here. Is it the mic being used, the XLR cable, the XLR connector, some other device? Often asking a whole set of people to turn their phones completely off is not realistic for a 12-hour day of shooting. Yeah, I get that, definitely. Um, and it's not necessarily the phones that are doing it either. So um, there are there are lots of considerations there. Um, first of all, you need to know your microphones really well. And if you you, you can generally figure out fairly quickly after some testing whether or not a microphone is prone to radio, radio frequency interference. Um, I've noticed that some of my mics are and some of them are not. So that's the first thing. And first of all, of course, you're gonna, if you have that option, you're gonna wanna choose a mic that is um, a little bit more immune to radio frequency interference. Uh, one that we tested fairly recently that did really well on that front so far was the Deity S Mic 2 budget mic in about the $360 range, so that one did pretty well. Um, what are some that I have? The Zoom, um, I think it's called the SGH6. It's the one that attaches um, to the Zoom recorders. I actually picked up some RFI on that when it was attached to the F1 recorder, the small recorder. So that would be one that I probably wouldn't um, highly recommend. So there, there's just an example. And of course, we can't go through all the microphones here, but that is one thing, your microphone. XLR cables generally do pretty well if you're sending a balanced signal over them. I haven't had a lot of issues that I'm aware of picking up RFI via the XLR cable itself. So, and as long as your cable's in good shape and your connector's in good shape, usually not the issue there. So there are some things there. Um, yeah, totally understand. It's not realistic to have people turn off their phones for the entire 12 hour shoot. <laughs> so there's some thoughts there. What I also do is I also have backups. So um, usually where I'm getting the most interference is gonna be on wireless and it's, you know, it's, it's gonna have dropouts and RF hits and things of that nature. That's where I like to have a backup of some sort on hand. So using a different wireless system that uses a different technology preferably. Um, for the longest time I used Roadlink and the Sennheiser G3. So Sennheiser was analog. Roadlink was using uh, digital transmission. So 
um, I could fall back. And there were a couple of cases where I had to fall from one to the other. And it wasn't like one was better. It just depended on where you were as to which one had an issue and you could switch to the other and it wasn't, there wasn't an issue. So that's one thing. Also having wired options, if you, you know, if it makes sense for the production and you can do it, that's another option. You can switch from wireless to wired if you have to. So just having a backup plan is another approach there. All right, next up is a question from Dan. I recently ordered a Zoom F4 and while waiting for it to arrive, I've been researching possible external power supply options. Sony NPF batteries seem to be the battery of choice for on-camera monitors and lights. Thus, I'm hoping I can use them to limit the types of batteries in my arsenal. I've learned Hawk Woods makes several NPF to high Hirose or high rose adapters with 12 volt regulated outputs, such as a couple of model numbers here, DVS QNR and DVAUX 2S models. Indie Pro also makes adapters like the 72SL SL5 that look promising. Are you familiar with any of these adapters or aware of anything similar? Any suggestions or opinions you would have would be greatly appreciated. Yes, I, had, I don't have experience with any of those particular items, Dan. I apologize. But what I do have is some experience with those brands. Um, Hawkwoods is, I think, a brand that more professionals generally use. I've had an Indie Pro Tools um, adapter that powered my Panasonic GH4 and my GH5, sort of a dummy battery that goes in and then you have a, a voltage regulator and then that goes to a Cine battery. And that actually went bad on me after two years of use. So, um, and I had another friend who was using an Indie Pro adapter of that sort and it also went bad. So I think the Indie Pro adapters, they're pretty decent, they're inexpensive, they're affordable, but I'm not sure they're necessarily going to do really well in the long run. Um, Whereas I think Hawk Woods generally puts out some higher quality stuff in, and based on experience I've heard from other people, I don't have um, firsthand experience with that. So hopefully that's helpful for you, Dan. Um, we have talked many times, just to follow that up, about false economies. This might be one of those situations. I'm not sure. Again, I haven't used the Hawk Woods. Um, but sometimes, not always, I get it. Sometimes there's a just an amazing deal that's inexpensive and it works really well and it works forever. <laughs> That happens, but sometimes also um, spending a little bit more will save you grief in the long run and save you cost in the long run. So just something to consider. All right, next up, Steven, I recently purchased the MixPre 10T and the Orca OR30 bag. I don't know if perhaps your 633 lives in your bag or if you've tried using the 10T in it like I'm doing. Do you have any suggestions for attaching the safety clips to the recorder to keep it from falling out of the bag if it should tip over, but also keep the clips from covering the encoder knob on the side? Yes, good question. Let me grab something. Okay, MixPre 10T here. The MixPre 10T, and actually let me grab one other thing while we're at it. Okay, this is the OR30. Uh, sound bag. It is actually made for the Sound Devices 633. It's not really made um, for the form factor of the 10T, which is actually quite different as you can kind of see here. It's hard to hold them. This is a lot skinnier and I think it's actually a little deeper as well. Um, so I didn't find that the MixPre 10T fit in this bag very well. Again, I love this bag, but I love it for the 633 mainly. <laughs> also works well for the Zoom F4 and the F8, although it's a, it's a little bigger than it probably needs to be for those two. Um, you can probably get down to the OR28 for those guys. Um, so some thoughts. Oh, just so those of you that are not aware, in sound bags, there are these little clips here. There are these um, retaining straps, sort of the nylon retaining straps, so that if... I do have some things that'll fall out here, but if you turn the bag upside down, the mixer won't fall out. It holds the mixer in there. And I've actually had that save me once. So it's a nice feature. The problem is, is those clips come up and wrap around these, uh, these metal straps here, these bars. Um, the problem is with the MixPre 10T, and this is the only complaint I, like the only serious complaint I have about this <laughs> Sound Devices MixPre 10T. This is the headphone and menu encoder. It's on the side. So when you have it in the bag and you have headphones plugged into it and the headphone jack is just right above the encoder, it's really difficult to operate this thing. And especially if the bag comes up here. Um, and then if you also have the strap coming up here and strapping here, it's just like, there's no way to ac access that. Um, so I've actually told Paul Isaacs at Sound Devices, I think, 
that was one mistake. Um, I would love to see this in the next iteration of this device, the hardware design. I know they can't change it now, obviously. It's not a firmware update. Um, but if they could move the encoder to the front somehow, that would make this um, ergonomically a lot better. But um, I don't really know of a way to do that. I was initially thinking that perhaps you could use the rear strap here, but the problem is, is that there's no hole to go through on this side. Um, so I'm sorry, I just don't have a, a good solution for that. I wish I did. Um, the, to, the truth is, is I generally, this is my backup mixer, so I'm not using, I, I've used it in the bag before. It's not my favorite to use in a bag. A lot of times I'm using this for corporate pieces where I'm operating from a table or a desk, so in that case, it's not a problem, but I definitely see what you're talking about, Stephen. I wish I, I wish I knew a solution for that. I think what I would probably do is K-Tech has the Stingray bags. Um, it's not gonna get around all those problems, but I think it fit, at least fits the mixer a little better. Um, but that's kind of a bummer because it sounds like you've already bought the bag. <laughs> so I apologize, I, I don't know of a great solution. All right, next question. I am looking to upgrade my wireless system, but the systems are sold in different frequency bands or blocks. Can you suggest how I can research which bands might be best for the area I live in? Well, um, I, that's where you just have to talk to the local sound mixers I don't, or, or the, uh, the places where they have sound installations. So a lot of churches will have those. They'll have wireless systems installed. You'll just probably want to talk to some local people and, and find out from them. <clears throat> Of course, you'll also want to ensure that you go to your government's website. In the U.S., we have the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, that uh, defines what frequencies you can use. So you'll want to do that for your country as well. All right, next up we have, oh, actually, follow-on question to that. I've been considering the new Sennheiser EW512P G4 Pro wireless system. It retails for about $900 U.S. It's a lot like the G3 or G4 systems with some upgraded features but I believe the main difference is the Sennheiser MKE2 Gold Lavalier mic. That is one of the main differences. I think another difference is you can feed phantom power from that transmitter, so you can actually connect it to a boom microphone as well, which is a pretty neat feature. Um, but yes, that MKE2 Gold Lavalier microphone is worlds better than the ME2, in my experience. Um, I, I think it's definitely worth the price, if, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> It is definitely more natural sounding. Um, the ME2 to me sounded very kind of mid-rangey and stuffy, but the MKE2 sounds fantastic. Um, so it's actually one of my favorite, it's probably the favorite lavalier mic I've used from Sennheiser certainly, but it's a, it's definitely at the top of my list. So I definitely like it. So thanks for those questions, Stephen. Next up from Thomas, I have a Sennheiser AVX lavalier system with that have built-in limiters. I also have the Mix Pre 3 with built-in limiters. I've just been keeping the limiters on in the Mix Pre 3, but do you think maybe I should turn them off? Well, I'm curious if you've experienced problems with that. If um, I wouldn't think that you would. Um, when I tested the AVX, the AVX, I don't, I don't know exactly how it's doing it. Those don't appear to be analog limiters to me. They appear to be some sort of digital processing, but I'm not entirely sure on that. Um, and I wasn't able to get that to clip at all. So you probably don't need the, the um, limiters on the Mix Pre 3 at the same time, but um, I think it, can, it doesn't hurt to leave them on at the kind of a, yeah, they're just gonna catch anything that were, were to come through, especially if you have other microphones hooked up at the same time other than the AVX, you'll probably wanna leave them on for those. So it shouldn't run into problems in terms of the two of them conflicting with each other, I wouldn't think. Um, but if you are experiencing issues, then yeah, definitely turn off the Mix Pre 3's limiters and see what happens. All right, next up from Alejandro. I recently discovered the Cedar DNS-2. Now, let me, for those that aren't familiar with that, let me explain what that is. It is a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a two-channel um, noise suppression piece of hardware that you use when you're actually recording in the field. And it, it uh, did I mention it costs thirty four hundred and thirty two dollars US? <laughs> it's pretty expensive, um, and it's pretty impressive. It does a really nice job at uh, helping to eliminate noise and focus in on the sound you're trying to capture, typically dialogue, um, which is what it's made for. And um, it, it sounds really great. And sometimes there are cases where you in a kind of a production setting where you can't control everything. Um, and Alejandro talks about a case here where the HVAC was blowing. The owner of the property didn't know how to turn it off. Um, and so they put a pillow on it and it turned it into a low hum. 
low hums are actually easier, I think, to, to, to get rid of than broadband. So that actually was probably improvement, but I understand there are some challenges. So here's his questions in relation to the Cedar DNS2. If you've used one, have you seen major improvements in your workflow? I have not used one, and let me explain why. These are generally going to be, I think they're probably most used in live broadcast situations. So cases where you're going to be out and about on location, but broadcasting live, and you need to do interviews or things of that nature, you know it's going to be noisy. That's where these probably have their biggest niche. If you're doing, if you're making recordings and then you do have a post process, um, you can easily do all this same high quality denoising in post with a variety of different plugins. And in fact, today we just published another video on our other channel about uh, a plugin called the Era D, which does denoising and dereverberation. So, um, in any case, yeah, I don't usually use this because I can do all that in post because I do have a post process. If you don't have a post process like in broadcast where you have to go straight to broadcast, then that's where this is pretty critical, pretty important. Have clients ever asked you for one or is it our own kept secret? Well, <laughs> no, they haven't because again, we have a post process. So for them, what they would ask for is probably, hey, it's kind of noisy. What can you do about that? <clears throat> and again, that would only be something I would probably use in a, a live broadcast situation. Next question, is there still post sound design work that needs to be done despite the fact that you're able to cancel out a good amount of noise on location? Probably not in most cases. If you get it dialed in, I guess really kind of the high, the, the, the potential risk is that if you don't get the settings dialed in just right, you can end up leaving artifacts. It can sound odd. So you definitely have to keep that in mind and, and kind of keep an eye on that. If you're connecting a shotgun mic to this device, can you use a high-pass filter like you can with some audio recorders? I don't know if the DNS itself has a high-pass filter, but yeah, certainly you can use a high-pass filter. That is actually something I almost always use when I'm recording on location because, um, and I'll only bump it up to maybe, you know, depending, the mic will have it set. You won't be able to choose the actual frequency in most cases, but my uh, 633 and, and most of the other recorders have the ability to, to change what frequency, kind of the center frequency of the high-pass. And what that does is it rolls off the low frequency rumble, which is generally not something you're trying to capture anyway. It's not something that's generated by dialogue, by human voices. So that will get rid of a lot of noise in the first place anyway. So yes, def I would still definitely use a high pass filter. Um, you'd love to see what my rig looks like with a Zoom F8 or F8N. Well, again, I don't use this, the DNS, so I do have an audio bag tour I did a while back. Um, but again, we don't, we don't really use the DNS in my work. Besides being on the pricey side and maybe not working on live reality TV or sporting events, what would be the pros and cons to having one for independent or film studios? Actually, I think it's the inverse. I think it is used mostly for live and it's not used as much for um, film. So, especially in studio. So, those are some thoughts, Alejandro. I hope that's helpful for you. Thanks for that question. Next up, a question from Aiken. Here's one of those odd little questions that I should know the answer to, but I'm just not sure and I can't find a definite answer online. When shooting dual system, Ursa Mini Pro, that's his camera, Mix Pre 3, audio recorder, Tentacle Sync E, whatever frame rate I record at, be it 23.98, 24, 29.97, 30 frames per second, as long as my native project timeline in Final Cut Pro is the same, then the sound and picture will maintain sync. Um, yes, but I think the most important factor is getting your camera, your tentacle sync, and your audio recorder all set to the exact same frame rate. That is the critical thing. Those have to be the same. Then once you've synced it up in post, um, I would stay on the same frame rate in the timeline, um, but you don't technically have to. Once they're, once they're synced, um, you can, you can do the crazy stuff of changing frame rates, but you're going to incur the costs of changing frame rates. Which if you, you know, if you have them, it's not usually a problem, but if you go to some odd factor, like from 2398 to 2997 or back and forth, things can get a little funky. So just so you're aware of that. But yeah, the most critical thing is getting the frame rate set up correctly on your camera, on your tentacle sync, and on your audio recorder. They should all be the exact same. All right. Um, also, and then you have a follow-up question, but if I were to shoot, say, 29.97, but edit in 23.98, then I'm going to lose sync? No, you're going to sync up before you put it in that timeline. What you're going to lose over time, if you do long takes, time code's not perfect. It doesn't keep things synced over time. That's still up to the camera and the audio recorder and the, um, mostly the camera and the audio recorder to be using high-quality clocks within them so that they don't drift. 
because really all like time code all time code's doing like a tentacle sync is doing is it's time stamping the files when you start recording and then the post software uses that time stamp and it says okay where's the first time within these two files the audio file and the video file where they line up and we'll sync them right there and then whatever happens after that if, it, if one of them doesn't hold good time they're going to drift out of sync so that is um that is where time code's not perfect so if you're doing long takes that's usually when that comes into play um, for those two i've actually found the ursa mini pro and the mix pre 3 to do really well together so anything under 20 minutes certainly is going to still be in sync um, when you start to get beyond that, it may start to drift a little bit, I think, over an hour. I don't do a lot of long-form video, so I don't know, but typically once you get to about an hour, you might see a portion of a frame or maybe even a full frame drift, but um, just something to know there. All right, follow-up question. Is there generally accepted standard frame rate for documentary TV production, i.e. broadcaster's preference for any particular frame rate? Absolutely, yes, because broadcast is usually done, at least in the NTSC countries, United States and Japan, I believe, um, that's usually 29.97. Um, Europe, I'm not positive. <laughs> but yes, there's generally a an accepted. So if you are going to TV, you'll probably want to check in with um, the station that you'll be going to. If you don't know what the station is, just contact a station and find out You know what their different standards are. Usually you can find something like that online. All right, next question from Anna. I am very keen on learning more about EQ specifically working with female voices in EQ. One of my talents for a series of videos I am making is a woman with what I would describe as a high-pitched voice. When I was editing her video, I personally was finding it difficult to hear her voice throughout the video. I'm not sure if it is because of the mic I used. I used a Rode Filmmaker lavalier kit. Anyhow, listening to the video sometimes would disturb my ears, so I decided to work her audio in audition. I played blindly with EQ par parametric settings, and the end result was a bit better th than what I started with. So my question to you, how can you make her type of voice sound good for video with EQ? She actually sent me a link and I went and listened to it. <clears throat> One second here. Um, that's like actually a really good um, item and we're gonna cover that in a future session. I need to do a demonstration to show that. Um, so Anna, that's a great question. Thank you for that. I've noted it and we will cover it in a future session. If you wanna send that file over, the raw file, I'm happy to use that as part of the demonstration as well. So thanks for that. All right, next up from Dick. When will there be an in-depth review from, uh, regarding the Zoom F8? And is there going to... Um, okay, when's there going to be a review? That review will probably be coming out in the next six weeks. <clears throat> Pardon me, having some allergies today. Um, I have. If you haven't seen it yet, I did do a first impressions video on my other channel. Uh, so if you just do a search for Curtis Judd Zoom F8N, you will find it. Um, and we demonstrate some of these things. There is no USB-C connection. That is correct. It is actually using USB mini connection. We're actually using it right now. Yeah, it's a USB mini and it's USB 2. So no, it is not USB-C. Um, some people um, are, are disappointed by that, I guess I should say. And I, I think it'd be nice to see them move to USB-C as well. For whatever reason, they didn't. Probably a cost is my guess. But um, it doesn't affect the performance of the, the device at all, from my point of view. Because really, that USB port is either for using it as an audio interface. Could it work with lower latency if they used USB-C? Perhaps. I don't know. Um, and then also, it's used with the FRCA, the, the kind of um, physical control surface. Um, and that does fine with USB-2. So... It's not an issue there. So yes, correct. It does not use USB-C. And then you ask also if there's no automatic triggering of the GH5 when you start recording the GH5. That is also correct. Um, it does not have that automatic triggering feature like the Sound Devices Mix Pre series has and also the Tascam DR701D. So um, yes, go. I, if you haven't seen it, I would definitely recommend taking a look at that first impressions we run through some of these things. Second question, uh, the Zoom has an auto mix function. And if I want a Sound Devices Mix Pre Series, is there a software post-production function available that can do the same thing? Well, there is, um, uh, as far as I know, no, there isn't. There is a plugin that works with some live digital production mixers. 
but I haven't found anything that runs on a PC in a digital audio workstation that I know of. So maybe someone else knows about that. All right. Next question is from Eric. Actually, the final question that we're, that we're sent in ahead of time. Uh, hi, Eric. Uh, Eric and I know each other. We've actually had dinner together and we've exchanged gear for various shoots and stuff. I was wondering if you had any tips that help get you through a shoot day. I'm sure a lot of us here are used to the typical 12 hour day and personally, I'm no stranger to those either, but I admit that sometimes I start getting pretty burnt out after the 78, seven to eight hour mark. Holding up a boom becomes more tiring. I become less observant about things like unwanted noise or clothing rustle. And I generally feel I don't always get the most optimal recordings compared to what I get earlier in the day. Do you have experience with this? If so, do you work through it? I would say, yes, Eric, we're all human. <laughs> and this is, a, this is the nature of being human. There are a few things that I do that hopefully can be helpful. And you may already be doing them. Some of you may not. Here are a couple things. Number one, you have to keep hydrated. So keep water on hand. Usually a paid production will have something like that available to you. But if not, have a flat of bottled water in your car when you show up at the production so that you're set in case they don't. Secondly, I like to keep food with me on hand as well, too, to get through some of those long stretches, especially if it's a physically demanding shoot, um, but something that can keep your blood sugar up where it needs to be. And I think that's really, really important, makes a big difference. So for the really kind of physically exertion type, exerting type of shoots, I like to have things like energy bars, cliff bars is, is generally what I prefer, but whatever works for you, something to keep on hand. Um, for the shoots that aren't as demanding, but that I still need to keep my energy, you know, the blood sugar levels kind of continuous, I really just like to eat apples. Um, the nice thing about apples is they don't jolt your blood sugar. They're, they're a little gentler. Um, so that's what I like about those. Um, and then also this one may just annoy some people, but I'm going to say it anyway. You need to get a good night's sleep before you do a long shoot, at least eight hours. Um, or I should say eight hours. Um, the reason for that is that our hearing as humans is partly kind of anatomy, but a lot of it has to do with our nervous system. And our nervous system needs the opportunity to rest. And if you rest, if you get a good night's rest before a shoot, your hearing will remain, sh remain sharper. Um, and so you'll be at the best level you can be based on your hearing. So that's another thing that I think a lot of people overlook. They get stressed out the night before and they're testing lots of things and making sure and going through their list a couple of times and making sure they got everything packed up. Really, really important to do that enough in advance so that you can get a full eight hours of sleep the night before. So hopefully that is helpful. Okay, we got a bunch of questions here in the live stream. Let's take a look here and see what we've got. Um, Sully Cortez says, thank you for showing us how to properly add audio to video so, um, so that when watching it on a TV, it doesn't make the speakers clip. You're welcome, Sully. Good idea. That is not off topic. That's totally on topic. <laughs> um, have you found any left-right 3.5 millimeter TRS splitters for the Mix Pre 6 outputs? Um, 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 uh, there are some on Amazon. I have some that actually go from a single 3.5 millimeter to two um, RCA, actually. They have those as well. Um, I'll see if I can find a link to those. But yeah, they definitely have them. What, what's happening in that case is you're going to split up into two mono. You're not, it's not going to balance the signal, but yeah, they, they definitely have those. And well, I'll try and find a link. Hi, I record videos of plays. Any suggestions on how to mic a stage when performers aren't mic'd? Any experience with boundary floor mics? I position two H4Ns, one either side, but it can sound uneven. Ooh, I have not recorded plays in that fashion. Um, typically what I do is, um, when they're not mic'd, um, ideally, I, I guess I would put the... Here's the trick is I would put it probably closer to the center of the stage and because you have the two um, stereo mics and that way it, it could be a little bit more even. It's still going to fall off depending on where the actors go. So anyway, that's something to consider, John, um, if they're not being mic'd. So that's a thought there. Will asks a question. Have you heard anything further on the high frequency noise being an issue in the mixed pre-series recorders while recording at 192 kilohertz sampling rates? Thank you for all that you do. Will, I have not heard anything more about that. I don't generally record at 192, and I haven't encountered that issue, but some people have described 
some um, odd issues when they do record at 192, and um, there's some high frequency stuff going on there, so I haven't heard anything more about that. I apologize. Um, thanks for your videos, Mr. Judd. Nice RE20 mic you have there. What is that boom arm? This is the Heil Audio PL2T. Um, that's holding that up. It's, uh, hopefully this doesn't make a mess of noise. There's just the end of it. I can't really pull it into the whole frame, but <laughs> thanks for the question there. Uh, Ethan asks, would you ever consider doing a sort of beginner's course of mixing to cover the basics for students interested? Um, yes, I have considered that. And in fact, this year I was going to do a post-mixing course. Um, I already have a course for production sound um, where we've talked a little bit about mixing live. So you can check that out over at Learn Light and Sound, sorry, school.learnlightandsound.com. Um, but in terms of post-mixing, it was something I was going to do this year, um, but some things didn't fall into place to make that happen. It's still on my list of things to do. So yes, I'm definitely considering it. I think it's really... Um, something we like to do. So uh, Ali also made a point here in the PAL worlds, it is 25 frames per second is the normal um, frame rate. So good, which is uh, 50 fields. Okay. Hello, Casper. I'm glad you already used the new thumbnail. Me too. Casper makes my thumbnails now. You, uh, you probably noticed that my thumbnails look a lot better than they used to. <laughs> thanks to Casper. So thanks so much for doing those. I really appreciate that. All right. Justin Bean is new. Welcome. I'm very surprised with your live stream. That's new on your channel. Very nice. Thank you. Ethan, what is the best way as a student to reach out and get experience in the field outside of going on paid sets? Um, that is getting together with your friends and working on passion projects, working on short films. Um, I think that's the best way to get experience. Um, if you have a film school somewhere in the area, go and offer to volunteer to help them out. They always need help on their shoots. So that's another way to do it. Uh, let's see. The MixPre 6 data is USB 2.0 speed. USB-C doesn't mean speed. It's a form factor. USB 3.1 Gen 1 or Gen 2 are the fast speeds normally associated with USB-C, but it isn't a requirement. Good point. Uh, thank you for that. And then finally here from Ethan, I was using a Sennheiser MKH 8060 on set once connected to an H4N, and whilst playback was fantastic, the actual audio on the edit was extremely quiet. Do you know how this happened or how to fix? Um, okay. Well, that sounds like a gain issue to me. Um, sounds like you weren't gained up enough. So I'm not, you know, there are a lot of factors there, of course, Ethan. I'm not sure what was going on. But if when you downloaded it to your computer, um, I don't know what you mean exactly by quiet. Where were the peaks? Were they, you know, what was the overall loudness in terms of LUFS? Um, if it was at minus 24 LUFS or minus 30, or min I even sometimes get recordings that I bring in that are minus 40, and that's okay. Um, that just means they're ready for pro post-processing, so um, that's not necessarily a problem. But the H4N is the H4N is always tricky. It's a really it's an, it was a really innovative product for its time. I love what they did with it, um, but those preamplifiers are really pretty noisy, and so it's hard to push the gain on that because then you introduce all that noise, but not pushing the gain, you're not getting a good sound to or signal to noise ratio. So then you also have other problems. There's no way to win with that. <laughs> um, so um, anyway, hopefully that's helpful for you, Ethan. Uh, next question. This is a good one. Is there any reason, this is from Bangs Naughty Bits, um, is there any reason not to get the M series of the Mix Pre consumer recorders like the Mix Pre 3M other than greater than 96 kilohertz recording. Are we losing anything to save the money? You are missing some massive things. Um, however, let me just say this. Whoa, getting lots of comments here. Um, is there any reason not to get the M-Series? Yeah, so there is. The M-Series is made specifically for musicians, specifically for doing multi-track music recording. It's really set up to do you know, to record a couple of instruments at one time, then while playing that back, record some additional instruments on additional tracks, so on and so forth. Um, there are an entirely different set of features that uh, location sound mixer needs, um, and they don't need those. <laughs> um, but you're also, I believe, giving up the ability to input time code. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that, in, I don't think it does. So really the M is 
I would say this, the Mix Pre M series, if you're a musician and you're only planning on doing music, then the M series makes sense for you. If on the other hand, you do some sound for film and you will also do music, you're better off buying the non M series for, of Mix Pre and then adding the $100 music plugin, plugin add-on, which is what I've done here on the Mix Pre 10. Um, I've got the music plugin on this. Um, and I wouldn't trade this for the Mix Pre 10M. It just doesn't make sense for what I do. I don't do enough music recording to, to make that worthwhile. Okay, next up, uh, have you ever recorded a classical orchestra? I have, indeed. And in fact, generally, um, I haven't done, I've not done it professionally. Let me just clarify there. I have done it just as a favor, um, but I've never done it professionally. I'm not really equipped for that. Really, I think what happens in those cases is you need to do a stereo recording. Ideally, you can put two matched microphones on stands that are well above or you know suspended from the ceiling well above the orchestra um, i don't have that equipment so that is probably one of the bigger things ideally that you can do that i've seen done professionally by other recordists so um, just some thoughts there have you experienced with wireless sdi hdmi transmitters and their latency i wonder if you've reviewed any wireless video transmitter gear i have not i actually had one sent to me once for review and it was um, the latency wasn't too bad. There's some latency. I'm not sure if the latency was in the camera, HDMI's output, or the transmitter itself, um, but it dropped the signal all over the place, and so I never ended up reviewing it. Uh, oh, great. Uh, Alan left a message here. Regarding the high-frequency sound in the mixed pre's, Paul Isaac said yesterday on Facebook that they have a firmware solution coming end of summer. So there's your answer. Hey, it's really cool to have a community, isn't it? Um, so Will, I think it was Will that you asked that question. Yeah, Will. So great, thanks for that, Alan. I appreciate that. Uh, next up, Ethan, also on the Ursa Mini, we had wireless Sennheiser mics. I don't know which type, but there was no audio after. I'm not very experienced with the Ursa, but how do I switch to the XLR1, two inputs in camera? Um, in the menu setting, there's a tab for audio. And on the tab, you get to choose what uh, the input is for the left and the right channels. So that's where you want to go for that. Uh, Will says thanks to Alan. I say thanks too. Dick says, hi, I want to use a mix pre-series, but also use the auto mix function. Is there a software product that is uh, real time or, or in post? No, Dick, unfortunately there's not, not for the mix pre. Um, for kind of the higher end mixing boards, uh, there is a plugin that works that does auto mixing with those. Um, and that's called, Dugan Auto Mixing, and I believe it's Waves that has that plugin. And then um, the Zoom F8 and the Sound Devices 600 series mixers also have it. So there may be some others. Oh, my uh, Alan and Heath, uh, this board right here also has an auto mix feature. So unfortunately, with the Mix Pre series, at least as of today in July 2018, we don't have any sort of auto mix feature. So, all right, we got all our questions answered, it looks like. I wanted to say thanks to everyone for joining. This is our first live stream in this format. Hopefully it worked okay. We're using a kind of a, well, I can tell you a little bit about the setup. We have a few more minutes um, for those that are interested. The sound here is a, an Electro Voice RE20 microphone that is routed into my Zoom F8N, which is sitting on the desk just down here. There it is. We're not gonna, we, I don't wanna jostle anything up here. <laughs> Um, I'm running the sub out uh, 3.5 millimeter into the Panasonic Lumix GH5S, which is what the, the camera is that we're using here. And um, then that comes out of the pan, so that's the sound and the video all in one. That comes out HDMI into an Ursa, or sorry, a Blackmagic Design Ultra Studio Mini Recorder, uh, and then in Thunderbolt into my Mac here. And then we're using OBS, which is a open broadcast software, um, free software that takes that stream and then that sends it over to YouTube, which is how we got where we're at. So um, hopefully it's working okay. I have no idea. <laughs> Nobody said anything bad yet. Um, okay, a couple more questions. Uh, Alan, what's up with the Alan and Heath board? Why do you have it? <laughs> Um, this is going to sound funny, but there are a few things. Uh, I, I'm actually using this as my main audio interface right now, believe it or not. Um, so it has a USB connection and it goes to the computer. It's really nice because I can hook up other audio sources to it. Um, and I've had, I found that it solves a lot of problems for me. 
Um, that isn't originally why I bought it, but I ended up doing that because my Antelope audio interface, um, I've become increasingly frustrated with that because um, what has happened is they keep updating. Let me tell, let me give it back up a little bit. Antelope Audio, Orion Studio. It was the original one. It's a Thunderbolt 2 interface. Um, it's really, it's a great interface. It, it has fantastic analog to digital converters, but what it is really made for is it's made for musicians. It has all these different emulations in it for guitars, emulations of old analog outboard gear, um, compressors, EQs, so on and so forth. They're things that aren't really useful to me personally because I just, I'm not generally using that for field recording, obviously. Um, but I got more and more frustrated with that because they would do all these firmware updates and add additional emulations and it would stop working. The basic functionality would stop working. I'd start getting all sorts of um, strange artifacts and things like that when I'm doing just basic playback from my computer. Um, and they keep saying they're going to come out with a new driver and they do and it doesn't fix the problem and I'm just frustrated and if anyone would like to buy one <laughs> you're welcome uh, let me know and I can sell that to you so um, this all happened after I bought the Allen and Heath the Allen and Heath I really bought as a control surface largely well first of all to do some live shows I do some live shows every once in a while not big shows generally um, <clears throat> that was that was one thing but also um, as a control surface for doing post mixing, you they have a driver that they're working on. Actually, their other units have it already. This one still doesn't have it. Now that's a little frustrating, but um, it's essentially a MIDI driver that allows you to map everything, and you can use that to do your mixing in post with your digital audio workstation. So that was the main reason I bought it. But I've found in the meantime that I really like using it as an audio interface as well, and it gives me a lot of flexibility to route things. So, for example, if for some Part of the time while I'm working on something and I want to listen to some music, I can plug my phone in here and play that. Um, just silly things like that. Would I recommend it as an audio interface? Well, it's a $2,700 mixer. Probably not. Um, <laughs> but it's working for me in my kind of weird way. So, And again, every once in a while, a small... Um, for small shows, I do every once in a while. So that's why I have it. Um, and then you also ask what camera I'm using. This is a Panasonic GH5S. And I'm curious how the autofocus is working. It seems to be doing okay, but uh, I'd be interested in what your, your impressions are. Next up, Ethan, I tried applying a high-pass filter in post on some audio we recorded in an air-conditioned room, but the product sounded like there was too much noise reduction applied, if that makes any sense, or do you have any advice? Well, yeah, you can't go too crazy with a high-pass filter because you'll start cutting into the dialogue, especially with men's voices. So generally, I have those centered somewhere around, well, depending on the software you're using, you can you can adjust the slope of the high-pass filter, and you can adjust the frequency at which it's centered. So usually I center somewhere around maybe 60 to 80 percent, or 60 to 80 hertz, excuse me, and then also I adjust the, the slope of the high-pass filter. If I really need to get a little bit more aggressive, I'll go with a more aggressive slope. If not, I can, you know, do something a little more gentle. Um, the There are a couple things, depending on the EQ that you use, if you don't use a phase coherent um, EQ, it can actually start messing with your waveform to the point where you're getting a lot of um, asymmetric waveforms. So you have to be kind of careful on that front. But if you, if you move that frequency too high, yeah, it's definitely going to start to affect the sound. So I wouldn't use that as your only defense when you're trying to clean up audio. I would use a broadband noise reduction plugin as well in most cases, especially if you're talking about air-conditioned room, which generally is going to have a kind of a broadband noise print. So there's some thoughts there. Uh, the GH5 is super sharp, yeah. Uh, sometimes too sharp, in my opinion, <laughs> for talking head things. Um, sometimes it looks great. Sometimes it's a little on the... Um, I, I actually, there are some settings in the GH5, all of the GH series cameras. Um, there's one called eye resolution. I think that is the very first setting that anyone that's using a GH5 should turn off automatically. Can't think of a single situation where I would ever want to use that. Um, basically what it does is it does uh, in-camera kind of digital sharpening and hair starts to break up and it starts to look awful. Um, but because of the small sensor size and the, the, the pitch of the, the pixels themselves, um, pretty decent optics for most of the lenses. Um, you get this really, really sharp. And then it does seem like there is some in-camera sharpening as well. Again, for the picture profiles I use, I generally turn that down by quite a bit. So we don't get too crazy. All right. I think we're going to call uh, call it a day here. 
Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in here. We have 20 people watching right now. Wow. And, uh, of course, I'll go ahead and send out an email to those of you that are registered over at the school at school.learnlightandsound.com. Um, I'll go ahead and send out a note uh, for you guys, just letting you know it's posted, it's up and available. Um, for those of you that are not signed up, it doesn't cost anything to sign up. You don't have to buy a course to be part of it. Um, but what you do is if you do sign up, you'll get the weekly emails where I will contact you and say, hey, we're going to have a Q&A session. Go ahead and send your questions in ahead of time. But we may do more live sessions like this. I think this worked pretty well, hopefully. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, and then also um, just kind of keep you up to date on what other other sessions are and also take feedback there so you can contact me directly if you want to. Once those emails go out, you can just respond and that email goes straight to me. So anyway, thanks everybody. Um, also just a, an update again, the Zoom F8 review, we're working on that at this time, getting some more experience with this. A couple of our previous sessions, if you missed those, talk about some of the features of the F8 in a little bit more depth. If you're interested in that, our review will be coming out again, as I said, in the next six weeks or so. And we are working on a course for those that are um, either working with the F8 or the F8N. Um, that'll be probably in the September timeframe. So thanks, everybody. Get out there and make some great sound. We'll talk to you again soon.